back to this special edition of Indianomics where I have two veteran banking experts to tell us where is Indian banking headed now with new rules for restructuring stress loans and a bankruptcy law and several other changes even in terms of uh, payment banks and small banks coming in and changing the very structure of the banking system. Uh, I have with me Mrs. Mortparia, the Managing Director and CEO of JP Morgan and uh, Leo Puri, the Managing Director and CEO of UTI AMC. Okay, Mrs. Mortparia, what is the success rate of uh, this uh, uh, sustainable debt restructuring scheme? Do you expect it to be substantial? So I feel that wherever there are physical assets on the ground, and for a variety of reasons, which I said we don't have time to get into, they've got into a distress situation. There are definitely solutions which are available. It can be the SDR, it's just a recast of debt, it can be part conversion of the debt into equity so that you make it more sustainable, it can be a change of management, and if the intention is bad, mm. then you re uh, take recourse to under the bankruptcy law and you know basically liquidate the company. So I have seen a fair degree of success in my career in, in uh, banking where you've had the maximum problem is where the borrower entity's intention is suspect. So he really does not want to do anything at that a, there could be foul play in terms of diversion of money etc and then he just wants to hang on and then you know our current judicial system gives ample time to that. So other than in those cases or where the base, there are no assets on the ground, right? You're just chasing something that does not exist. Otherwise, by and large, I would say we've been pretty successful. Normally, we have promoters who want to run their company well, I mean, at least in the current case of stress assets, but who also have made a fast buck. Uh, you, do you therefore think that this is still sustainable? Uh, I'm asking you because last time around, there also was the advantage that after 2003-2004, we had this excellent run in the global economy and in the Indian economy. Assuming now that the global economy will limp, do you think that uh, uh, this uh, swapping debt to equity will really bring too much by way of return? Therefore, what is the success rate of this? No, I, think the, I think the success rate is reasonable because this is how restructuring actually happens. It happens with a mixture of promoters leading the way, forbearance shown by banks and a decision-making process which allows you know things to move forward and I think we have all those three ingredients here uh, there is a risk that some people will attempt to misuse it and who knows some may succeed mm. but the scheme does have some uh, there are prior filters that are put in place so projects need to be viable first of all mm. the discussion around what is sustainable unsustainable needs to be fact-based mm. The discussion around the valuation of the equity again needs to be fact-based and will happen in a fact-based way and the pain therefore is intended to be taken yes. by the promoter in that sense. And the alignment therefore between the promoter and the bank is brought back into sync mm -hmm. and therefore you have a chance of actually getting the engine going again. So if those are the conditions, uh, I think they'll be able to separate out A, those which are totally unviable about which we know those promoters who clearly are willful, as Kalpana says, mm -hmm. and not intending to play game. Uh, but those will be the minority. Uh, I think a reasonable number will actually work their way through. You need two other things to happen here. One, of course, is a general underlying recovery, yeah. which cures most ills. This is what happened, in fact, the last time round. We were saved not so much by clever interventions, but you had a recovery. Most promoters don't set out trying to build companies that are going to go bad. They set out building companies that they think will succeed and even in those instances and I don't know how frequent that is where there has been diversion of funds usually they are sensible enough to divert funds uh, you know which are not going to impair the viability of the project but their calculations go wrong because the economy doesn't actually operate the way there is fundamentally they're there to make sure companies are successful and work I'm not getting to the moral questions yeah. of uh, okay. you know, so your uh, point what, what is that happens. will ensure the success. And I think they therefore want it, they want it to succeed. So if you have promoters who want these projects to succeed and banks who have now shown forbearance in a way that is not imploded on them, mm. where they have been safeguarded from that, and you've been smart enough to select viable projects, of which there are many. We already know that there are many viable projects. I, you know, I hope, I, I hope to see many of these things succeed. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Murray, do you think that uh, uh, the bankruptcy law will be operational in a year because that will be the big stick as you first pointed out
to ensure that promoters fall in line. Yeah, so the infrastructure is going to take time. It's a very much a step in the right direction, but it's not going to overnight uh, kind of change things, but it's definitely paves the way for a much better environment. But Lata, we should talk about the opportunities in banking, not just restructure. Okay, what would you say are the opportunities in banking? Uh, in fact, at the moment, I'm a little scared about opportunities because you have the payment banks coming and, uh, you know, disrupting in a fashion. You have small banks, I guess they will only expand the horizon. You have this unified uh, payment interface, which is also going to make life difficult for the payment banks. And then there is the load that uh, legacy banks are carrying at a time when they have these nimble competitors. Where is the opportunity? I only see challenge. No, no. See, uh, the way I look at it is, if you look at overall penetration of any financial product in our system, and even credit, India is woefully behind any other emerging market you can talk about. And so, we need the small banks, we certainly need the payment banks, and all the fintech revolution that's taking place, we are assuming that the banks are not going to be a part of it. If you would asked me this question 20 years ago, you would have said ATMs and the state-owned banks, you know what happened. You know, Reserve Bank of India very carefully licensed every new branch that a private sector bank would have. That gave ample time to the public sector banks to catch on on technology. So I think we are constantly underestimating the ability to change and the ability for a country like India to leapfrog. 20 years ago, if I remember right, it was a McKinsey report, Leo, mm -hmm. which said that you might be able to sell a few hundred million telephones because it was going to be a rich man's <laughs> instrument. Yeah. Look what happened. And therefore, we are completely underestimating the overall impact of all of the technology and digitization uh, revolution that's taking place. And India has this unique capability yeah. of straight away bypassing the brick and mortar, the desktop, into our handheld. So to uh, weld both these issues together, you think that uh, given the technological disruption and expansion and the uh, uh, you know, inherited load, uh, you see two years from now, most India, or even one year from now, Indian banks, legacy banks in a stronger place? So they will definitely need to work out the distress situation today. I feel a little... Uh, I disagree slightly with Leo. I don't think it is as gargantuan an issue as we are making it out to be. Wherever my experience tells me there are physical assets on the ground, you need to take a pain, but that pain is, pain is not 100%. Right? Yes. No, it's not. Sorry. And therefore, all of the tools that we talked about just now is going to help them. I am actually seeing the first signs of recovery in what I call the core industrial listing. If you look at any one of the lead indicators, steel consumption, cement, uh, power, uh, CVs, uh, the tractors, tractors and, and this in an environment where rural is severely impacted by the successive droughts that we've had. That comes up, we're still not seeing an investment pick up, on it, but as soon as you see this demand consumption come up, Indian entrepreneurs, definitely have animal spirits and you will see an investment pipeline building up. I don't uh, disagree uh, with that. But I, yeah, last uh, sure. words on how do you see this burden of challenge, a burden of uh, yes. uh, inherited problem and the disruption? So I, I am a bit more concerned actually on that front than Kalpana is because I don't see where th these opportunities are there. The question is who's going to capture them. And it's not obvious to me at this point that many of the banks that we have, the 27, 28, will be able to participate in these. In fact, today the outlook for their future revenue stream is very dim. It's very blurred indeed. Even if you were to fully provision them and put them back on their feet, they will probably topple over again because they can't actually earn enough to justify the capital that would have been put in. As an investor, that's one of the dilemmas we have is why would we want to capitalize an entity which you does not have... There's you would say that about all public sector I, banks I, I or I wouldn't some? be as sweeping, but I would say a majority. Mm -hmm. and, and each bank will develop its own strategies, no doubt. But this is where the real work is needed, is that even if you put Humpty together again, mm -hmm. it's not clear that it could actually walk successfully. And you don't want to put something together and again having to put it back into ICU. And this needs real serious thought. 
under the current systemic constraints which they are operating, whether it's to do with people, decision making, recruiting, I mean, you know that you know it all. Uh, uh, I don't see their being able to participate, despite many fine individuals. Just to be clear, I agree, and I have no issue with that. I, I, there are extremely fine individuals in many of these banks, but they are not in an environment today where they will be able to capture this. There's not enough time today to go into, therefore, the, the big elephant in the room, which is around where will the future of the governance ownership lie. But that is the ultimate urgent issue. Once we've dealt with this fire, we need to actually deal with that uh, with some sense of vision and strategy. That gives me a very good reason why I can invite both of you again, and you will have to agree to come for the next discussion. To, uh, 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 you know, check out how the Indian banking system will look probably two years from now. Well, key takeaways from our guests. One, that the pain will look much less, uh, or at least less, a year from now and much less two years from now, simply because growth is underway and Indian banks in the past have shown an extraordinary ability to overcome both technological uh, uh, challenges as well as their inherited problems. That's a veteran banker telling you who has been there, done that. And then the word of caution coming from Mr. Puri that uh, Humpty Dumpty can topple again because some part or a large part of definitely the public sector banks need serious governance changes and at the moment it's not very clear whether those governance changes are coming. Thank you very much for watching this edition of Indianomics. Thank you Mrs. Gurfari. Thank you. Thank you.